boy, what a great night. What a magnificent... Hello, what are you, oh, hello there. What are you doing there on the air? Boy, you know that one out, don't you? All that stuff, you're playing commercial programs on the non-commercial radio show. You're, <laughs> you're going to have to log that, you know. And uh, it's a very scary thing. I'll never forget the night that somebody, by mistake, put the John Gambling theme, and there were two heart attacks and one terrible, terrible stroke that was suffered by a lady up in... Westport, there's an awful thing, but but, but we're here. <laughs> it's a it's a magnificent night. I'll I'll tell you this this kind of night, with the wind and the snow and all the stuff blowing around, it either brings the roses to the cheeks, it uh, brings a touch of the uh, of the of the spook to that to that deep old soul. I I don't know. Are the, New Yorker is a very funny thing. I. Do you do you have the the vague feeling that you enjoy underneath it all what appears to be on the surface a disaster? That the reality of a disaster is very enjoyable because so much of our life is totally unreal, you know. It's very little to find that's real, and uh, you sit and you watch movies. I, I just I suspect that most people today live about ninety five percent of their life enjoying vicariously other people's lives through the medium of plays, movies, books. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And there's very little actual movement done. Although I suspect that a lot of people today define life as going to movies and plays and reading books. That's what life is, and uh, all the other jazz in between, like earning the dough to buy the books, to pay for the plays, is just a drag. You know, it's just the stuff you have to put up with so that you can see Arthur Miller's newest insight into real life. And uh, it, uh, it it so so when the day comes when it snows. Or when it rains, or when the flood hits, uh, there's one of two reactions you can have. Either there is the wild, exultant thrill of suddenly finding yourself involved in something that actually gets your ankle wet, it uh, actually uh, gets you stuck, or else there is the fantastic panic of a man who is totally abdicated and is now completely vicarious. The great panic where he immediately leaps into the nearest air conditioned bar and sits there until next Wednesday when it's all melted, and he can you know, come back out again. I, I, uh, I believe that, really, I believe that our city one day will be in the form of a giant bubble over the whole city, and we will have finally achieve what Freud always said we wanted to do anyway. It's a return to the original mother cocoon, and uh, that will be carefully heated to blood temperature or thereabouts, and it will be filled with Muzak, and there will be an artificial sun that can be turned off and on at will, depending on the majority vote, of course. And once in a while, there will be a symbolic storm that will be held in a stadium where we can all go and watch the storm, and we'll get wet a little bit. Now, of course, the water will be very carefully controlled, filtered, and it will be heated, so it won't get you too wet. Uh, have, you, have you read about this insane baseball field they're building down in, in Houston? Sure, it's going to be the first totally enclosed Ball field, which is the the final. This is going to be the final defeat of baseball. I suspect that one of the great things about baseball, in fact, all sports, is not only the fact that you're fighting against the rules of the game, like trying to get the ball from your goal line to the other guy's goal line, but also the vagaries of nature, the turf, and all the rest of it that goes to make up the life we're living in. Uh, did you notice uh, that how incensed all the New York sports writers were that it was cold in Chicago when the Giants got their you-know-what whipped? Well, uh, somehow this was a plot by the Bears against the Giants. It was a terrible, rotten thing and should not have happened. It just shows the kind of skullduggery that is, is today goes on in professional athletics. Well, as a matter of fact, it was just as cold, I suspect, for the Bears. Uh, now, the, the first thing you're going to say is they're used to it. Well, whoever gets used to kicking a football around at 10 degrees, I don't think they were any more than the Bears. But that's the way football is, friends. It is liable to be 10 degrees when you play. It is also liable to be 88 when you play. I'll never forget that. I would tell you about the time I played a football game when the temperature stood at 101. Oh, brother. Oh, gee. Oh, wow. Oh, man. I'll, I'll tell you, though. But nobody believed it was a plot. I mean, nobody says what we ought to do is put a bubble over the field and air condition it. Uh, it was 101 degrees, and it was, th it was that afternoon that convinced me that, that I was more of the sedentary type. Uh, <laughs> it convinced me of a lot of stuff. First of all, I lost about 19 pounds, 
But uh, what made it even worse was that was that the, the uniforms of, uh, that, that we had a particular day were of knit wool jersey. Now, now uh, today most of the most of the uniforms, of course, uh, you still find a lot of teams that will use that type of uniform—a light knit wool jersey. Uh, jersey is knit wool. Most of them, many of them, will have nylon. Uh, a lot of them will have very light cotton, the breakaway cotton. So if you grab a guy by the back of the neck and he's going for 78 yards, the back just comes off. You know, it's the breakaway numbers and <laughs> stuff. But uh, but we were wearing wool jerseys, and uh, you put wool jerseys on. You put a pair of shoulder pads on you. You put sliding pads all over you, and you put hip pads on you, and then you put a pair of very tight football pants, which do not breathe, on you. And then you start running around at 101 degrees. Let me tell you, boy, I'd much rather play a football game at 10 above any day of the week because you generate a lot of ergs out there. You, 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 you've got a lot of BTUs going just in general running around. But uh, down in Houston, they are going to put this, uh, this ball field is going to be under, under glass. It's going to be totally controlled. Well, now, what, uh, this is going to do a lot of things. There is, there is nothing more delightful than to see an outfielder racing out for a long shot up near the center field wall someplace, and the wind has got it, and he's going one direction, and the ball is going the other. And then all of a sudden he realizes this, makes this frantic leap, dives, slides on his, on his face for 35 feet, and then makes a one-handed scoop. You won't see any of that in Houston anymore. It's all going to be about as exciting as a game of ping-pong played at the Y. Uh, really, it's, it's, it's going to take away one of the most important parts of the game. Then another part of the game, of course, is a pitcher who is fighting against the heat. Uh, he, he, this is a great thing to watch. Say, Whitey Ford, he, he wilts under real hot temperatures, and he really gets in trouble about the fifth or sixth inning. So, so a, a ball club is sitting in its, in its dugout hoping that it gets hotter when they're playing his way. Come on. Huh? And, and Ford is out there sweating, and he's changing uniforms every three innings, and he puts on another one, and finally the seventh inning they get to him, and there is some excitement. Under the new system with the bubble, none of this will happen. Now, a lot of people say that's improving baseball. No, it is improving baseball about the way... I would say, uh, well, it's like improving plays by taking away all, all fluffs, taking away reality, breathing, walking around, clumping, uh, snorting, sweating, all the other stuff that happens in a real live performance. Take all that away, and you got nothing. you just got this drab thing going on. But nevertheless, the minute that I heard that this was going to happen, I thought, well, that's good. First of all, you realize that there are many pitchers who need, who, who are wind pitchers. Nobody talks about wind pitchers. You know, Mike, uh, you know what a wind pitcher is? A wind pitcher? Well, a wind pitcher is a pitcher who uses the wind. He's great again in, in, on windy days. He loves to use the wind. And, uh, and his curveball snaps off like a shot, boy, when he's pitching against the wind or in a crosswind. These pitchers, of course, uh, under, under the condition with the bubble, they're just going to be like anybody else. Then, there's, then there's, uh, there are a lot of things which... Uh, which I remember uh, have gone out of sports because of this insistence on total control, absolute total control of the elements as well as control of the ball. I remember uh, watching ball games, for example, out at the Comiskey Park, uh, a ball game, a day ball game, when uh, there would be a lot of trains outside, a lot of trains going around in the roundhouse out there and going up and down at the 12th Street Station, and these great, great clouds of smoke and steam are coming in. Well, Mike Krevich, being, uh, being a center fielder for the White Sox and being an ex-coal miner from Pennsylvania, was great at playing ball in the total dark. So, so Krevich could play the smoke better than any outfielder I ever saw. So they'd crack these long shots directly into the wind in center field in, in, in Comiskey Park, and it would disappear. You'd be sitting back at first base or something, and you'd just see the ball, and it would disappear into the smoke just disappear into the fog and the smoke, and you would see this tiny figure drifting around down there. He would play the smoke and the fog the way Willie Moskillany, believe me, can play a three-cornered <laughs> shot in, in balk line billiards. He, he'd play the smoke, literally. Well, uh, we, we, there were, this, this is dead. Forget it. When uh, I suppose somebody was up there defending the Giants. Huh? <laughs> well, well, uh, well uh, there's, there's a lot of problems here. I... 
uh, I don't I don't know whether to, to tap dance or not tonight because you know it, sometimes you you uh, where are you going to start? Uh, it's difficult to know where to start when uh, if you, if you work in the ter- let's say satire. It's uh, for a long time now, satire has become increasingly difficult to do. Have you have you read recently in in newspapers they say where where are the great satirical comedies in the uh, in the theater? Well, I'll tell you where they are. They're on the front page. Uh, because it is impossible to satire a satire. It really, it literally is. And so uh, the final comedy will be eventually, I suspect, a total fantasy that will have nothing whatsoever to do with real life. Uh, a typical example of that is Oh Dad, Poor Dad, which is a comedy that does not refer to anything that ever happens. It's just a comedy. It just stands out there. Because how are you going to do a great satirical cook? Here, now here's an example. Now, how are you going to satirize this? Now, if I if I read you a, a here is a uh, an ad for a perfume. It's called Gold Water. Gold Water. Do we have any? Uh, uh, please, would you give me some? Uh, uh, no, uh, give me the, the the tape over there. There, the big one there. See the round one, the tape. That's right. Give me give me cut two there, Tony. I will need patriotic music for this one, because uh, and I'm not going to to needle it at all. I'm just going to read it straight. And I will uh, ask you, how in the devil can you satirize this? Speaking of the devil, this is WOR, AM and FM, New York. And uh, speaking of satires, self-imposed division, we'll be here <laughs> until, until midnight. I Sometimes, you know, you listen real closely to the station, you wonder who's putting who on. Well, I, I, are you all set out there? Uh, you got it in there, Tony? All righty. It's the second cut. We we must have all set now. All right. All righty, row. While you're out, up to that, I see. All set now? All right. Now, we read this advertisement in its entirety and exactly the way it is printed in... All right. All set. Uh, patriotic music. Let's go. Bring it up. Bring it up all the way. Now, let's go. No, no. Gold water, a cologne for Americans. How to smell very nice. Splash on gold water, spicy, partisan, and pungently American. Gold Water is actually an expensive department store fragrance, conservatively priced at $1.25 a bottle. Order Gold Water for yourself, your friends, and at least one liberal. Also great for raising funds for your favorite organization. Gold Water, the cologne for Americans. All together, gang, now. Put it over the top this time. We are going to carry it to the very pinnacle. All together now, let's go faster. Very good. Very good. And uh, now, if you think that I am being funny, that is from that is from a very serious political magazine. Uh, it is it is uh, the New Guard, the official magazine of the Young Americans for Freedom. This is a notoriously deep-thinking outfit. <laughs> and uh, how can you satirize it? I mean, what are you going to do? You see, there you are. You can only stand and scratch. That, that, that anything that I would try to do about that whole scene would be paled in insignificance by the reality of the scene itself. Now, uh, how... I, I, guess, I guess the satirist works best under conditions of a certain kind of absolute morality. Uh, for example, I suspect that during the 18th centuries, 18th and early 19th centuries, uh, that the, that the uh, scene was a different scene, that, the, that the, uh, the kind of morality that was not only implied but was actual in most of the lives of the day lend themselves to satire when these uh, moralities were at war with the actuality of what was going on. In other words, a guy like, uh, say, somebody like, uh, oh, I suppose uh, Voltaire would be a good example. That Voltaire took a society which had a set of basic moral principles. 
that it professed and to a large degree attempted to live up to. And then he held those uh, principles up on one side and then painted on the other side of the page the uh, picture of what actually was happening. And then you had satire. That was satire. Uh, it is very difficult then to satirize a, a, a society where there are no moral absolutes. Very difficult. Take Swift now. Uh, certainly when Swift was writing about the English culture of his day, that England had a set of really uh, stringent moral laws, rules, mores, attitudes, and so on, by which it lived. So when Swift talked about his, his adventures among the Weenanums and the Yahoos, his adventures uh, among the Lilliputians, uh, Swift was, was comparing again the, the, uh, the morality of, a, of an established thing of a, of, that everyone had agreed upon and attempted to live up to, and then the attitudes and the actions that were displayed in reality. So here you had satire. It was very, very fine. But it's very Im almost impossible to, uh, to do satire. All you can do is read out of the paper, and you've done satire, literally. Now, I'm sure that a lot of angry people are going to call in and say, what did I, I this rotten thing I did about going?